Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, maybe I'm going to introduce myself uh, just a little bit more. Um, I'm, um, I'm an ecologist. Uh, my background is uh, yeah, forestry and, and ecology. And um, I'm working for, for IRD. It's the French Institute for Sustainable Development. It means that we have the same status as CNRS, but we're working for for and in developing countries. And I mostly work in, uh, in West Africa. But my lab is in Paris, in Sorbonne University. Um, this, is a, this is a lecture uh, we give uh, with Luc Abadi at uh, Sciences Po. And it's the same type of um, um, course as here, meaning that we try to teach ecology to people with uh, very different backgrounds. So we're going to talk about, oh, yeah. And what I wanted to say is that I, um, I'm an ecologist, um, but more and more in my career, I have I am attracted by uh, application of ecology, so ecological engineering, agriculture, um, and so on. And that's the, the context of what we're going to talk today. Mm, I think I'm removing my mask. Um, so we're going to talk about agroecology, and agroecology is the ecological engineering for applied to agriculture. Um, it means that basically we want to um, yeah, agriculture is a, is a manipulation of an ecosystem to produce food or to produce fibers if you're cultivating cotton, for example. Um, so uh, the idea of agroecology is that if we put more ecological knowledge into agriculture, uh, we could develop uh, an agriculture that is more um, sustainable. And this leads to my first question. Um, yeah, clearly agriculture is no longer sustainable now, or at least a part of agriculture. Do you know why agriculture is not sustainable? So. Because it needs from uh, a lot of inputs from outside and uh, it degrades in the soil and brings a lot of ecological problems. Also, it's a CO2 intensive, uh, carbon intensive, and so on and so far. Okay, uh, any other answer? But yeah, anyway, that's, that's a, good, um, a good start. Um, basically, one problem with agriculture is that it's um, using resources in a non-sustainable way. Uh, um, agriculture, at least intensive, um, modern agriculture is based on the use of a lot of um, fossil fuels. Um, it's based on inputs, uh, pesticides, fertilizers, and uh, pesticides and fertilizers, they are not, I mean, they're not bad in themselves, um, but we know that pesticides have a lot of negative impacts on, on biodiversity, and um, fertilizers are not produced in a sustainable way, we will see that uh, later. Um, and as you were mentioning, we're um, by destroying biodiversity and also by degrading soils, agriculture is kind of um, degrading its own capital, its own mean of production, which is kind of uh, crazy. And, I, I, and yeah, when I'm saying that agriculture is not sustainable, this really means that we can no longer go uh, this way. Uh, so. Okay, intensive agriculture is not sustainable. We also need, for, um, need a more multifunctional agriculture. What I mean is that more and more we're asking agriculture to produce food, but also agriculture to protect biodiversity, to store carbon, to uh, clean waters, uh, so and so. Okay, um, yeah, just a quick slide to show that the, the, the worldwide uh, food production or protein production has increased. Um, yeah, for, from this is a, this has the two last decades. These are the two last decades. Um, but overall, we could look at a longer time period. Produ uh, the, the production of agriculture has increased a lot, um, which is of course very. I mean, that's a success. That's very good, and that's also allowing to feed. Uh, the world human population, which is really important because this population is, um, is still increasing. However, uh, all this is not sustainable. Um, yeah, with the light it's not very clear. Um, but uh, this graph is showing that uh, agriculture 
uh, in France is producing um, about 25% of the greenhouse gases. Uh, this is due to the, the use of um, fossil fuels. This is due to the use of fossil fuels to, um, to produce fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer. Um, yeah, basically. Uh, talking about the impact, environmental impact of agriculture, uh, this map is showing the, um, the pollution by nitrates of, uh, of rivers uh, within Europe. And you see that you have many areas where it's quite dark, uh, meaning that agriculture is using too much fertilizers and these fertilizers, um, yeah, that's a big problem of fertilizers, is that they are not um, nearly like 40% of fertilizer might go away from the fields where they are spread uh, just because you have heavy rains and the rains are just um, removing the fertilizers and they are going to the, to the waters, to the rivers, for example. So that's bad because uh, this is um, um, perturbating, disturbing the functioning of the, of the water ecosystems, of the aquatic ecosystems. And also, you know probably that nitrate, when you have too much nitrate in the water, you cannot drink it. It's no longer drinkable. Um, yeah, th this, is, uh, yeah th this is another example. Um, this map is supposed to... Um, display the proportion of the primary production that is um, appropriated by humans. So primary production is a um, total quantity of organic matter produced by an ecosystem. Basically, that's the growth of plants, that's the organic matter, leaves and roots produced by the, by the plants. And uh, what this is showing is that depending on the ge geographic area, uh, humans are taking away uh, from 12% um, of this primary production in Africa up to 80% uh, in South and Central Asia. Basically, that's because of agriculture. We're using, we're exploiting ecosystems to produce food. And uh, if we're exploiting this ecosystem intensively, uh, we're exploiting a high percentage of the primary production. So that's just um, uh, a way to measure um, human impacts on ecosystems and, and the biosphere. Um, yeah, this is uh, this graph uh, displays the global cereal production uh, from the 60s to up to 2000. So we see that this global cereal production has, in, has been multiplied by two, uh, roughly. Um, this is really important because uh, I think that's Hmm. Seventy percent of calories um, ingested by humans are coming from cereals, uh, rice, corn, and, and wheat. So this means that we have doubled, nearly doubled the production of food, which is um, which is really good. Uh, but we see by the same time that during the same period we have increased uh, in the same proportion the use of uh, nitrogen fertilizer, phosphorus fertilizer, and water with which is irrigation, the use of, we're collecting water to uh, grow our plants. So this means that, uh, okay, agriculture is a success, but is mostly based, this increase in production is mostly based on the use of uh, more and more inputs, um, which is neither good or bad, but as we were saying um, before, um, this, for example, these um, fertilizers have negative consequences on ecosystems, on biodiversity, and so on. Um, probably I will say it again later. The other problem is that uh, nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers are not produced in a sustainable way. Uh, do you know how we produce uh, nitrogen and, and phosphorus fertilizers? Okay, so nitrogen, it's easy. Um, the, the source of nitrogen in ecosystems, it's the nitrogen, the N2 from the atmosphere. You have a lot of N2 in the atmospheres, and you have bacteria, uh, especially bacteria in symbiosis with, with what we call uh, legume plants, like um, clover, for example. And uh, these bacteria in symbiosis within the roots of these plants, they are able to fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere and to integrate this nitrogen into uh, their own biomass. And that's the way nitrogen can enter natural ecosystems. 
And that's very fundamental process because all the nitrogen needed by life on, on in continental ecosystem is coming from these bacteria that are fixing the, the nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, so bacteria are doing that using as a source of energy um, biomass. By, by, by basically, these bi bacteria are eating uh, organic matter. Uh, you know, they, f they find it in the soil, for example. And so it's uh, sustainable. But humans, to produce the same fertilizers, basically we are using uh, fossil fuels as a source of energy to fix this N2 from the atmosphere. So it's working pretty well, but it's requiring, requiring a lot of energy. And uh, this is not sustainable, obviously, because we want to stop using these fossil fuels uh, because of the, to stop or to mitigate uh, global warming. That's for nitrogen, so it's not sustainable. And for phosphorus, uh, it's not sustainable either because the phosphorus is coming from mines. Uh, there are some countries in the world where you have a lot of uh, mines of uh, phosphor phosphorus. Um, I guess you have some in Algeria, Canada, South Africa. And um, the problem with mines is at some point they just get exhausted. And as for, um, uh, as, as for oil, there are calculations about how many years of phosphorus we have in the mines. And it's difficult to, to know, but it's about I guess it's about 50, year, 50 years, maybe more. Uh, and of, of course, if we spend more money to, to, to go deeper or in other places, we can find a bit more phosphorus. But for sure, at some point, we will have to stop using phosphorus fertilizers. Uh, OK, we can forget. Um, yeah, we were saying that soil uh, are degraded by agriculture. Um, some people are assessing that about 40% 40, 40 of soils are, are degraded. Uh, you have a lot of um, processes uh, leading to this degradation. Um, you have erosion. Basically, erosion is the removal of uh, soil particles uh, by um, winds, uh, water, rains, and usually it's quite—I mean, it's quite bad because usually it's removing the top, the top part of the soil, and this is the, the part which is uh, the more fertile uh, because it's the part that is containing the more organic matter, the more uh, nutrients. Um, a lot of agricultural soils are also losing organic matter. Uh, so maybe I should explain a little bit. Um, in natural ecosystems, plants are growing. They are producing uh, organic matter for uh, photosynthesis. And this, when the plants are dying, when the, the roots are dying, when the leaves are dying, the organic matter is going back to the soil. And um, this organic matter is kind of decomposing and processed by bacteria, fungi, earthworms, um, all these organisms. And this leads to uh, an important stock of organic matter within the soil profile. And so this organic matter is um, <coughs> containing carbon. Uh, and this is very important in the context of climate change because of course, if we want to um, reduce or to, to mitigate climate change, it's, it could, a solution could be to store more organic matter, more carbon into the soils. And the other important point for agroecology is that this organic matter within the soils is very important for soil fertility um, because this organic matter um, uh, allows the soils to better um, stock, store uh, waters. It allows also, also the soils to better store uh, mineral nutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen, and so on. Um, and also this organic matter, it's important. Basically a soil, it's a mixture of organic matter and, and mineral, uh, mineral matter. And it's important to have a good balance between organic matter and minerals because um, they can be glued together and they form what we call soil aggregates. And it's very important to have these soil aggregates uh, in the soil. It's important for the growth of plants and for agriculture. Uh, so anyway, what is important also is that very often um, farming leads to a decrease in the amount of organic matter within the soils, uh, which is decreasing fertility and which is releasing carbon uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, okay. This map is supposed to show you the, the in green, you have forests. And uh, basically, the goal is to show you that the, the largest impact of agriculture on biodiversity is just by uh, changing what we call the land use. 
So basically, to humans, to feed ourselves, we have destroyed forests to replace the forests by uh, fields. And I mean, we need food, so we have to somehow we have to destroy at least a part of the forest. And what we see on, the, on, on these maps is that, uh, of course, if you go to the uh, European northern country, you have a lot of forests and you have big patches of forest. When you go to, um, for example, to France, uh, patches of forest tend to be smaller just because in between you have fields. And this is impacted negatively by biodiversity a lot, um, basically because some animals, um, some plants maybe also, requires, require big patches of forest to, um, to maintain, basically. Um, this figure figures shows that uh, the, de the decrease in the um, abundances of birds in Europe between uh, the 80s and, and now, basically. Um, so maybe maybe you have heard about this, uh, these figures. Um, the cause of the, this decline of birds is maybe not fully clear, um, but partially it's Partially, one hypothesis for that would be that we have less and less insects because of pesticides. And because we have less and less insects, uh, we have less food for birds, so we have, less, uh, we have few, fewer birds. Um, okay, with the lights, the, 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 the pictures are not very clear. <laughs> but basically, here, this, uh, this photo is probably from the United States, and you, you see a very, very large field, large open field. So we, this is a, a representation of intensive agriculture uh, with no longer any biodiversity and, and so on. And here on these photos, you're supposed to have um, a small um, family field in Africa, probably Senegal. And I, what I want to say here is that um, mostly today we're going to talk about um, when I'm saying that agriculture is not sustainable, it means that I'm, I want to say that uh, modern intensive agriculture based on inputs is not sustainable. But we have to remember that uh, at a um, uh, larger scale, at the global scale, we have still many types of agriculture. Uh, and that other types of agriculture are still working. Um, and yeah, to say that quickly, uh, the problem is that, for example, traditional agriculture in Africa is probably more um, respectful of biodiversity. Somehow it might be more sustainable than intensive agriculture in, in France or the United States, but um, probably this agriculture is not... Pr pr um, oh. uh, this agriculture is not providing enough, enough food for the farmers, uh, or at least it can, it, it's okay for, to, for, to feed the family. Uh, in a traditional system, most of the time people can feed very okay on, on small patches of, of land. Uh, the problem is that when the human density is increasing, or when you have to feed more and more humans that are living in cities, uh, then the, the pressure on the soil fertility and the ecosystems is becoming higher and higher. And probably these traditional systems are no longer sustainable when you put more pressure on them. Which means that, okay, Mostly we're talking about uh, making this type of agriculture more sustainable using agroecology, but uh, other types of agriculture that are probably more respectful of biodiversity. We should also maybe transform this type of agriculture to produce more food, and maybe agroecology could also be useful in this context. Okay, this is uh, the... the, the the, the, the way I, I represent agroecology. Uh, basically, uh, agriculture is about manipulating an ecosystem. And um, an ecosystem, it's, okay, I haven't put the word here, but it's biodiversity, interactions between biodiversity and between, for example, the soil. And, um, yeah, basically, th this is agriculture, a manipulation of ecosystem. And with classical agriculture or classical engineering, basically the idea is that we are using a lot of energy, a lot, a lot of inputs to manipulate uh, these ecosystems. And of course, it's, leads, it's leading to the provision of different services. Um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with, about, um, with the notion of ecosystem services. 
Um, ecosystem services are all the services that are provided by ecosystems to, uh, to human populations. And basically the idea is that uh, with agriculture, we're using a lot of energy and inputs to manipulate some ecosystems and to um, provide foods, basically. The problem is that it's not sustainable because we are using a lot of non-renewable -re uh, resources. We're also degrading biodiversity, soils, and so on. Um, and this is also leading to what we call disservices. Uh, this service, it's the contrary of a service, basically. So, for example, for agriculture, when we're polluting waters with, with nitrates or pesticides, this is a kind of disservice of agriculture. So the idea of uh, agroecology, okay, we're still manipulating an ecosystem, we're still manipulating with a field, basically, but the idea is that using ecological no knowledge, we will use less non-renewable resource and energy to manipulate these ecosystems. So we're trying to benefit more and we're trying to make the best of all uh, ecological interactions between in, within your ecosystems. And this is supposed to, um, to allow uh, to improve um, the, eco the ecosystem states. So instead of degrading the soil, we're going to improve soil fertility. And we're still going to provide um, to, pr pr yeah, to produce some food, a lot of food, ideally, uh, but uh, we should uh, decrease uh, these services, uh, for example, because we will have used less pesticides, so we will contaminate less waters with uh, pesticides. So that's really the idea of uh, agroecology, to replace uh, non-renewable sources of anything by ecological regulations, ecological mechanisms, within the field, within the, the ecosystem. Um, so one, one motto could be, yeah, we want to develop an ecologically intensive agriculture. I kind of like this expression. Um, maybe I'm not fully sure about this expression in the sense that, okay, uh, we, we still want an intensive agriculture because we still need to produce food um, and, and a lot of food. Um, what I'm not sure is how much food we can produce with agroecology. Uh, I'm sure we can produce a lot of food, um, but probably the, the yield of the fields with agroecology could, could decrease uh, anyway, so it's going to be intensive, but maybe not that intensive. Um, okay, at this stage, do you have, um, do you have any question? I'm going pretty quickly, so... Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, um, the basic thing you have to know, there are less lights here, so it's better for me. Um, if I'm going to the, 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 the basis, uh, I was talking about plants that are producing organic matter using photosynthesis. And um, to do that, plants, they use uh, the light as a source of energy. And they are f plants are fixing the CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, so they are incorporating new carbon into their own biomass. But to, for your cells and for plant cells, you need carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, it's carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. But you also need uh, mineral nutrients. You need phosphorus, you need uh, nitrogen. You need nitrogen for the proteins. You need phosphorus for the, the cells, the, um, the, the, yeah, for the, 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 the cells, basically. Um, so we need uh, fertilizers, phosphorus fertilizer, nitrogen for fertilizers, to help the plants to grow because the growing is not only CO2, it's also phosphorus and nitrogen. Then uh, at a global scale, the only, um, okay, what I did not say is that in a natural ecosystem, phosphorus is coming from the mo what we call the mother rocks. The soils are developing on, on rocks and the as I was saying, the soils is a mixture of organic matter coming from the plants and rocks that is degrading, that is going into some small pieces to sand, to, to loam, to clay. So in the natural ecosystems, uh, the soil is forming and the degradation of the mother rocks is uh, bringing phosphorus. And it's, um, 
in a natural ecosystem, basi basi basically everything is recycled locally because the plants are growing, they are taking up nitrogen and phosphorus in the soils. The plants are dying, they are decomposing, their biomass is decomposing, and it's delivering again the nitrogen and the phosphorus into the soil. And it's going on like that. Uh, of course, in agriculture, um, the problem is that, by definition, with, we are exporting a part of the biomass. If a farmer is growing cereal, it's because he wants to ex export the grains to feed and, and, or to sell. Uh, but anyway, in agriculture, you have exportation of a, part of, of a part of the biomass. And because we're exporting a part of the biomass, we need to put back some mineral nutrients in the soils. And that's the reason of, uh, we are using fertilizers. And about phosph phosphorus, the idea is that um, uh, it's not possible to, to do industrially what is going on in a natural ecosystem, meaning that we cannot take standard rock and um, degrade it, process it to remove, to take the phosphorus and to give it to the fields. So we have to find uh, places in the, in the rocks where you have a lot of phosphorus. And that's the reason why you have, you have mines to take the phosphorus. And as all mines, they can get exhausted. Well, does that answer your question? Is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> you had a question? No? Okay. Yeah. So now if we take this phosphorus from the soil and it's in the plant and we eat it and whatever, in this modern cycle, where does the phosphorus go? Oh, uh, <laughs> basically it's going to the, it's called, I, I guess it's called the, the sewer. It's all the, the, the wastewater that are going out of the towns. You have a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen in, 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 in these waters. And uh, that's a good question because, um, um, Again, the problem is that uh, in natural ecosystems, everything tends to be recycled r locally. Um, not fully, but that's the trend. And with humans and with uh, the building and the development of cities, of course, we take a lot of foods from the countryside, we're bringing the foods to the cities. And what is a source of fertility? The waste is becoming a, a source of pollution. And we have to, um, to retreat, re retreat to clean the waters. Uh, and, and partially this process is leading to, um, we're removing a part of the nitrogen from these waters and we're there, this nitrogen is going back to the atmosphere as um, N2, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> Uh, so uh, a part of the solution is to use these waste waters as a source of fertility. And I still, uh, I, I, it's feasible and it's already done, but you have um, um, health issues because of course these uh, waste waters, they contain mineral nutrients, but they also contain um, heavy metals, antibiotics, um, pathogens. Um, so you have regulations about this, the use of wastewater. Yeah. There, I think there was another question. Uh, are there any alternative to alternatives to nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers? We we um, we're going to to see that in, during okay, the lecture. Yeah, that's I think. what I thought. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I I move a bit forward. Um, so the, the now the lecture is divided in a kind of uh, four four or five chapters, and yeah, maybe the first chapter is about closing the nutrient loop. And basically, closing the nutrient loop be means that we have to, um, yeah, to find sources of fertility. And okay, we know that the, the plants are needing um, nutrients, uh, so we have to find a way to provide mineral nutrients to the plants without uh, losing these nutrients, to, um, which leads to water pollution and, and so on. Um, so the goal is to decrease losses of mineral nutrients and the goal is to decrease the use of mineral uh, fertilizers. Um, so I give an example. I'm sure you don't really see what you should see on the screen. Um, one problem with uh, intensive agriculture, it's what we see here uh, on the top panel. Um, Basically, uh, cereals are uh, annual plants. Annual plants are plants that are living one year and after one vegetation cycle, they just die. 
so this means that in when we grow cereals during a part of the year, the soil is uh, bare. You don't have any plants growing on the soil. And the other, the, the other problem is that even when you have um, cereals growing, maybe it's corn, uh, uh, in between ranks of plants, the soil is still uh, bare. And this is a problem because this, this is leading to leaching. Leaching is a removal of mineral nutrients from the soil by waters. When you have heavy, heavy rains, the rains are uh, going into the, the water is going into the soils, and within the, the water you have mineral nutrients that are going down. And this is the reason I, why then oh sorry, the nutrients, the mineral nutrients are going down. They are going into the groundwaters, and then they are going into the rivers, to the lakes, to the shores, and so on. Um, and this is, uh, this is going on partially because the soil is bare and um, because plants are protecting the soil basically from the, the rains and fr from the heavy rains. And another problem is that during, for example, winter, uh, when the soil is totally bare, you don't have any plants growing. So you don't have any plants that is able to take up mineral nutrients at that time. And this is something totally crazy for an ecologist because as an ecologist, I know that in natural ecosystems, you always have plants. Of course, if the climate is very cold during some a part of the year, the plants are not go growing, but basically you always have plants, especially at, with a climate as, such as Par in Paris, you always have plants. And the problem with this system is that during winter, you don't have plants. You have some mineral nutrients that are produced by the decomposition of organic matter. And we are losing these mineral nutrients because we don't have any plants. So a solution, probably, yeah, the solution is to grow at the same time what we call uh, cover plants. This means that, for example, we will grow some small grasses or we might, we might want to grow legumes. I was talking about the fact that legume plants are fixing the nitrogen from the atmosphere. So it's kind of good to have cover plants, to have legumes as cover plants, and because they are going to enrich the soil in, with nitrogen. But the other important thing is that these cover plants are protecting the soils from the heavy rains, and they are decreasing the leaching. They are also decreasing the soil erosion. So this is... Um, uh, allowing to better conserve uh, mineral nutrients. That's, uh, that's an example. Um, yeah. Okay, that's another example. Uh, in, in my team, and Luc Abadi has, I mean, is working also in my team, and he has studied this for a long time. We're working in, in African savannas, and we're working especially in one savanna in Ivory Coast. Uh, which is called Lamto Savannah. And in these savannas, um, you have, well, the definition of a savannah is that you have a mixture of trees and grasses. And you have these grasses. Uh, they are not annual grasses, they are perennial grasses. So they live for maybe for 50 years or maybe, maybe more. They are making, they are growing big, uh, big tufts like that. So uh, in the middle of the, of the rain season, the grasses can be that high and uh, the tufts can be that about this size. And what is important with uh, this is that they're growing uh, a dense root system and it's a perennial root system. And um, probably a perennial root system is what we miss in annual cropping system with cereals because this uh, dense root system is um, really able to take up efficiently the mineral nutrients um, within the root system. And um, what's, what has been shown is that, uh, what is important is that you have this dense biomass of roots, and of course sometimes a part of, uh, every day a part of the roots are dying, that's just life, and this Roots are dying, but they are decomposing quickly. And because the root system is perennial and the root system is dense, the mineral nutrients that are uh, uh, provided by the decomposition of the roots uh, are quickly taken up by the roots. So there is no, there is no loss of mineral nutrients just because the, 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 the root system is very dense and perennial. And I can say that I've been working in the savannas. I've also, I've also been working in um, working with making experiments with wheat in uh, around Paris. And it's really crazy. I mean, in the savanna, you have huge densities of uh, of roots, 
And if you're going to a field here in France, basically you have no roots. I mean, okay, you have roots, but the, 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 proportion, the, the amount of roots is really small. Uh, so probably this is an important mechanism of efficient recycling within the soil. And what we have shown also in this savannas uh, in, in Ivory Coast, it's a bit complicated to explain, is that um, these grasses, they are inhibiting, inhibiting what we call nitrification. Um, probably I should give some explanation. Uh, I was saying earlier that plants to grow, they need the CO2 from the atmosphere and then they need some mineral nutrients from the soil. And they're combining the two to make their own biomass. Then the roots are dying, the leaves are dying, and they are decompos decomposed. They are de decomposing. And decomposition, what is it? It's uh, basically bacteria, fungi, earthworms are eating this dead organic matter. They are eating the leaves, the roots, and so on. And doing so, they are releasing CO2 uh, through respiration, and they are releasing mineral nutrients. The mineral nutrients that are within this organic matter, they are released when they are eat when they are eaten by fungi, bacteria, worms, and so on. So basically, decomposition is the, exactly the com opposite of photosynthesis. So it's uh, again, it's about recycling. And okay, it's becoming slightly complicated. Uh, when uh, the organic matter is decomposed, it's first releasing ammonium. Ammonium is NH4 plus, uh, so it's a cation. And um, this is something that the plants can, can absorb. It's a good source of uh, nitrogen. But then some bacteria are transforming the ammonium into nitrate. And you know that the nitrate is a big source of pollution for waters in, in France, in, Fr in, in France, in French Brittany, for example, because of this heavy use of uh, fertilizers. And uh, what we know is that the, the, these waters are polluted by nitrates because nitrate is very mo mobile within the soil and uh, ammonium is not that mobile. So these plants, what they are doing is that they are uh, producing small molecules uh, that are um, released by the roots. These molecules are targeting the bacteria that are um, doing the nitrification. So they, the, these plants are impeding nitrification. So the nitrogen remains as ammonium. And this is decreasing a lot losses of nitrogen from the, uh, from the ecosystems. So what I want to say here is that um, somehow it's a bit of science fiction for, for the moment, but some people are thinking about developing cereals that are no longer annuals, but that are perennials. This means that instead of having to, um, to, put, to, to put new seeds every year, uh, for your cereals, you would have wheat or corn that would grow for maybe five years, ten years in a row at the same place with perennial root systems. And that pr would probably um, increase the recycling efficiency of the different uh, mineral nutrients. And uh, some other people are thinking about, uh, basically we want to understand how these grasses in African savannas are inhibiting nitrification. And then we want to give this capability to the cereals we are growing. Um, so this could mean selecting new cereals, or this could mean um, GMOs, if we find the, the genes that are, doing, uh, that are allowing these grasses, these savanna grasses to inhibit notification, we could take the genes and put them into uh, cereals. Um, I'm, I'm not really in favor of GMOs, but I mean, why not? Why not? Um, okay, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, I go to another, another chapter. Um, they ba basically, I, 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 I have just given two examples of how we could um, increase the efficiency of the nutrient cycling within fields. Uh, in fact, you have many different possibilities, uh, and we will see later that basically combining species, com combining, combining crop varieties could be a, a solution. Um, another solution is to decrease the amount of fertilizer we're using. Uh, using a lot of fertilizer allows to, to, to increase a lot the production, but it's also the reason why we're losing a lot 
these fertilizers. So decreasing the amount of fertilizer is probably a good solution. Um, another solution that, uh, that, have some that, that has some drawback is to, uh, instead of putting all the fertilizer in one time, at, what ta at what one time, you can um, spread the fertilizer many times during the vegetation cycle. Uh, so you put small uh, amounts of fertilizers, and this decreasing, this is decreasing the the, the leaching of fertilizer, the uh, yeah, the removal of uh, fertilizer by by rains. Um, so we we still have to talk about uh, nutrient supply and nutrient cycling. Um, hmm. This is what I was saying about nitrogen and, and phosphorus. Um, Basically, uh, okay, you have the, the, the mother rocks here, the bed rocks, you have the soil here, you have the plants growing, and the nitrogen is coming from the atmosphere. The nitrogen is, uh, is fixed uh, by some bacteria, from the, it's coming from the N2 from the atmosphere, and probably you don't see anything here, but you have some phosphorus within the bed rocks, and this, uh, the degradation of the bed rock releases uh, phosphorus into the, into the soil. Um, so here you have a map of the, basically the mites, the mines of phosphorus uh, at a global scale. So you have some of in South Africa, uh, yeah, Morocco and Algeria. You have some, yeah, China. I did not say China earlier and United States. Um, so obviously the problem is that the mine can, the mines can get exhausted. Uh, okay, we can. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, the, the photos are showing um, traditional cropping systems in, um, I think it's, yeah, it's in Burkina Faso. And uh, in many traditional cropping systems, you're, um, you have a mixture of cereals. Here, it's probably, it's probably corn. A mixture of, uh, of uh, cereals and uh, trees. Um, and uh, there are some studies that uh, tend to show that it's good to have trees in cropping system because the trees they have uh, deep roots, uh, because they are perennial that they, and, and they grow for a long time, they can uh, grow deep roots within the soils. And of course, it's important for them, especially in Burkina Faso, to take up uh, water. Uh, in a dry climate, uh, trees need to have deep roots to, to survive during the, the, the dry season. And people also think that um, uh, trees are important um, in such systems because with these deep roots, they can directly take up phosphorus in the deep soil layers. And of course, what, okay, oh, probably it's not very clear, but the idea is that uh, the phosphorus is coming from the degradation of the bed root works. So you have phosphorus here at the bottom of the soil. And of course, the plants, um, they tend to have more roots at the soil surface. So at the soil surface, uh, you tend to have more, uh, less and less phosphorus, especially in the cropping systems, because you have your cereals. The cereals are taking up uh, the phosphorus from the top soil layers, and then we remove, we export the grains. Uh, so you tend to have more phosphorus at the bottom of the soil, and you have to, to have less phosphorus at the top of the soil. So probably what's, what trees are doing is that they take up, they absorb uh, phosphorus uh, from the bottom soil layers. And of course, a part of this phosphorus is brought to the leaves. Um, and of course, the leaves at some point, they are going to die. So the trees are able to bring back some phosphorus from the bottom soil layers, and they are bringing this uh, phosphorus to the top soil layers. So it's kind of maintaining the phosphorus fertility of the soil. Uh, okay, and okay, on, on this photo you should see a nice picture of um, of um, agroecology of agroecological systems in in France. Uh, so more and more people in in Europe. I mean, you have a lot of traditional cropping system based on this mixture of grasses and trees. And more and more, even in France, we're trying to develop again this type of systems where you're mixing trees and, and, and cereals. Basically, here you have uh, probably poplar trees and you have wheat 
in between. And um, probably the mixed, um, okay, as a savanna ecologist, of course, if this is appealing to me because it's kind of savanna, it's a mixture of um, grasses and, and trees. But then probably this, uh, these trees are improving the nitro, uh, the, um, the recycling of the, the efficiency of the recycling of the mineral nutrients. Probably they are able to take up phosphorus from the bottom top soil layers and to bring the phosphorus up to the top soil layers and where the roots of the, of the cereals can take it. Uh, so this type of system is probably um, interesting. Any, any questions on all that? Yes? This uh, picture shows the trees kind of uh, on the sides for the phosphorus, uh, I guess. Uh, are there also like small kinds of other uh, weeds, no, not weeds, grasses for the ammoniac in between these kind of? Because no, I, I mean, the, 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 the nitrogen should come from the, uh, from the atmosphere. So to, to fix more nitrogen, we, we, need, we would need legumes. And uh, actually, we could, um, in some agroforestry systems in Africa, for example, or South America, they, they use uh, legume trees, such as um, acacia. Uh, acacia trees are legumes, and they are fixing the nitrogen from the atmosphere. So it's not the case here, but that's a good idea to use uh, legume trees in between your cereals. But here we would still need nitrogen from the outside of yeah, the system. Yeah. No. Thank you. But, but what I think is that the trees are um, improving the efficiency of the nitrogen cycling. Uh, for example, during the winter, there, there will not be uh, any cereal. Uh, the ground will be bare uh, between the trees. But the, the roots of the tree will still be alive and will be able to take up a part of the mineral, uh, the nit mineral nitrogen. So probably it's improving the, the, the recycling of nitrogen even if it's not bringing new nitrogen into the system. Other question? Yes? This is maybe a bit far off, but uh, I, like, I read something some time ago about nitrogen in I read something some time ago about nitrogen in Germany that they would fertilize so much and uh, the industrial like nitrogen was kind of like, how do you say, like less complex than, than like natural uh, nitrogen, or like the soil was full, or the argument went somewhat this way. Uh, and so the article was saying that trees have a less uh, well ability to reconstruct themselves, so to like heal wounds or something, because they're filled up with like such simple nitrogen chains or something. Yeah, I'm not, sh I'm not sure, but for sure we're really using a lot of nitrogen. I mean, it's, ki it's, ki it's really kind of crazy because uh, it's what I was saying earlier, but about, I think in, in intensive cropping systems, cereal cropping systems, the farmers are losing 40% of the nitrogen they're putting into the soil. They are losing this nitrogen because they put so much of it that uh, you have leaching, the, 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 the nitrogen is, is leached by the rains. And basically it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It, it means that, um, to be sure that they are maximizing the possible yield, uh, the possible uh, production of grain, they are putting such amounts of nit nitrogen, but of course they know that they are losing it, a part of it. But it's a way to maximize the production, but of course it has many uh, drawbacks. Thank you. Okay. Um, one other problem with, uh, for, for which uh, modern agriculture is lacking sustainability. It's uh, the problem of pesticide. Basically, we're using pesticide because uh, we need to get rid of um, disease, caterpillars, insects. You have small um, worms within the soils that are called nematodes that are eating the roots. And um, basically, we need, I mean, somehow we need the pesticide because um, we have to get rid of all these uh, disease and pathogens and, and so on. And um, one thing maybe you, 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 you should remember is that um, 
Um, yeah, we basically when we are growing in a not in an in an intensive way, uh, weeds, corn, whatever, uh, vegetables, whatever. Um, basically, we are growing, and very often it's large surfaces. We have very large fields. We are growing the same plants, and sometimes we have the same plants growing in other fields around at the um, regional scale. And very often we're cultivating the same plants for different several years at the same place. And basically, um, um, yeah, basically, uh, it, this is selecting for insects that are going to target this source of food. This is going to select uh, bacteria, fungi that are going to eat the plants because it's so much food at the same place, so, so much food of the same quality that it's going to, to attract a lot of insects, pathogens, and so on. And it's really uh, kind of uh, for an ecologist, it's really easy to understand why all these insects, all these pathogens are going to attack uh, the crops. And um, yeah, also uh, maybe more difficult to explain, but because the crop is very homogeneous, uh, you have one species, very often only one variety, so it's kind of one genotype of wheat, of corn, and so on, um, it's going to um, select uh, fungi, insects that are that are getting specialized on eating this uh, this food, on eating this crop. So these um, pathogens, fungi, insects, and so on, they are very efficient at attacking the crops. Yes. Do you think that the use of GMOs can? Um diminish the biodiversity or the genetic variety of the of the crops and then attract more pesticides so it's going to be kind of a destructive um, cycle okay well um i can say a few words about that but it would be clearer in, in the next slides but basically um Okay, I'm not totally against GMOs, but uh, the one problem with GMOs is that usually they are using the same approach as with um, other crops we have selected. They are very, I mean, they are, yeah, they are extre extremely homogeneous genetically. And what I'm going to say is that basically the problem with uh, modern intensive agriculture is that they are very homogeneous in terms of what we're growing and also in terms of genetics. And that's one reason why it's difficult to get rid of all the pathogens. So um, some GMOs could be a part of the solution because uh, some GMOs are developed to be resistant to some caterpillar, to some insects. Uh, but then um, uh, these GMOs are selecting new resistance. These insects become, are becoming able to eat the GMOs in a way. So it's short-term solution maybe, but in my opinion it's not a long-term solution. And um, okay, I'm an ecologist but I'm working also on the evolution of organisms, evolution of organisms in the, in the Darwinian sense. It means that yeah, organisms are evolving, their genet genes are changing because of natural selection. And um, what I was saying when I was saying that insects uh, are selected to eat um, corn, for example. It, uh, it's really selection in terms of uh, Darwinian selection. And GMOs are doing exactly the same because they are very homogeneous and be because we are growing the same GMOs on very large surfaces. It's a strong natural, it's a strong pressure uh, for the evolution of all the pests. So you have, um, each time we are producing new GMOs that are supposed to be resistant to a pest, pests are becoming resistant to the GMOs because they are evolving. And the solution probably is to increase the biodiversity of the crops we are growing. And that's the idea of the next slide. Uh, so of course you don't see anything. Um, basically, that's a famous experiment. It was in China about 20 years ago. And um, I think the, the pest is a, is a fun fungus and the fungus is um, attacking the rice. And uh, the, in this experiment, they are mixing two varieties of rice. One variety is sensitive to the fungus, and the other variety is very re resistant to the fungus. 
and they have shown that mixing these two varieties, they are reducing a lot the, um, the impact of the attack of the fungus, and they are also reducing the, the, um, yeah, the need for pesticides, basically. And uh, nowadays, it's very, uh, something quite well studied. Uh, basically, if you increase um, the genetic diversity within your field, um, this is going to decrease the risks of uh, attacks from pathogen, insects, and so on. Um, and basically, the idea is that, um, uh, for example, in this case of the, of the rice, half of the rice plants are resistant to the pathogen, and the other one not. But then, if by chance the, fungi, the fungus is arriving on a, on a plant of rice, there is already 50% uh, of chance that the fungus will not be able to attack the rice because the rice is, uh, is not sensitive to the disease. And then the other mechanism is that you imagine, well, you have different ways to do that, but one way is to have one rank of rice of this variety, another rank of rice of another variety that is not sensitive to the fungus. And what is going on is that when you have the fungus on this rice, so on this rank of rice, um, the disease is going to have difficulties to spread to another ranks because you have kind of barriers made by rice that is no, no, not sensitive to the, to the disease. And the idea, the general idea is that when you're mixing different varieties, um, you're kind of diluting the possible impacts of pests in, in, your, um, in your field. And apparently it's, uh, it's relatively um, efficient. And um, yeah, so basically the idea is that it's really in interesting to, instead of, um, yeah, the problem is with modern agriculture is that we're cultivating only one species at the same place and we, are, we have homogenized the genetics of this species because we have only one variety that has been selected to be very homogeneous. Uh, so possibilities would be to grow um, crop varieties that are more diverse genetically, or we could also just mix different varieties. Uh, it's very easy to do. You, you, you take different varieties of rice, different varieties of corn, and you mix them together. Um, yeah? Okay. Um, I don't e I'm not even sure about what are on the slides. Um, okay. The, what is important also is to, we, are, we have been talking about uh, mineral nutrients, closing the, okay, a question? I, d I don't understand your question. <laughs> Maybe remove your mask. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I asked just why they keep doing that then? Why they don't use diversity? Oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Basically, in traditional cropping systems, uh, people are mixing together a lot of species, and very often they are mixing varieties or um, at least um, farmers, they have always been selecting what they are growing. And in traditional systems, they are selecting varieties that are not homogeneous genetically. Because, yeah, they, some, um, because they don't have the mean to homogenize genetically their, their crops. And also, they, they, I think they really want to keep the diversity. And of course, when you... Um, with modern intensive agriculture, uh, I mean, I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, but at least one problem is that we want to be able to um, cultivate using machines uh, because we're no longer uh, cropping, um, harvesting uh, by hand, we're no longer uh, using animals for tillage, so we need big fields and we, make, we need homogenization. We need this homogeneity. For, uh, to use machines and to increase the yield and to be able to, to allow a farmer to, um, 
uh, in modern agriculture, a farmer with machines can cultivate uh, hectares and hectares, while um, in Africa, a farmer without any machine can only grow a few um, hundred meters, square meters. Um, so yeah, th I think in, in the process, the homogeneity, homogeneity is important. So we have also homogenized the, the crops. The genetically and, and so on. And of course, um, I don't know, for example, in, in many cropping systems in, in Africa or in South America, they're growing corn and between the corn you have uh, chilies and beans. And, uh, and of course it's possible because everything is harvested by hand. Uh, and this is not doable with uh, big machines. Uh, so that's a, the part of, st of the story. And I, I think then that the... Um, the, the I think we have tried to apply the, the industrial paradigm to, to cropping system and to agriculture. Uh, so in, um, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know anything about uh, the production of, uh, I don't know, uh, cars, for example. But the, the paradigm is that everything has to be homogenized to, uh, um, um, to optimize everything in the production and to produ produce more. And I think people have tried to do the same in agriculture. And that this has been working. So somehow this, uh, this has been working. But to do so, uh, we need the pesticides. We, we need the fertilizer because the pesticides and the fertilizers allow this homogenization. They are parts of this system of homogenization because with the pesticides and the fertilizers, we are able to provide a kind of optimal environment to a kind of homogenized crop. Uh, wheat, corn, whatever, we, which is very homogenized genetically. Um, so yeah, that's the paradigm of industrial paradigm and, and the paradigm of homo homogenization. And of course, um, as an ecologist, I mean, I can understand that, and I can, I, I can, I, ca I kind of be, I, I am able to explain that to you, but as an ecologist, this is kind of crazy, because as an ecologist, I know that in natural ecosystems, that's what I'm going to say now, we have a lot of biodiversity, we have a lot of diversity, we have a lot of heterogeneity, and all this is very important for the good functioning of natural ecosystems. So in uh, agriculture, we have done exactly the reverse, we have transformed diverse and uh, heterogeneous ecosystems into uh, not diverse and very homogeneous systems. And um, this is part of the problem, yeah. In this uh, part, because um, maybe to answer a little bit uh, the question that Mael has uh, raised, and it has to do also with a policy problem. For example, in, in I come from Colombia, and we have like the majority of uh, our production is not industrialized, and this is traditional. But some uh, package, like some uh, public policy, for example, um, to improve the productivity in the in the countryside, um, comes with a package. So the package is the GMO uh, seed, which I don't know if you know if like people here know that, but GMO seeds cannot be self-reproduced as traditional seeds, for example. So the package for the poor peasant comes with the seed and comes with the fertilizer and with the pesticide. And you need to have like some quarters of production sometimes. So it, it has to do a lot with the policy, with the public policy and how is it designed. And it, um, at the end, it is um, impacting in the loss of biodiversity of the seeds and also it's making peasants and, and like uh, local people dependent on the, like on the states, but on the company who is uh, providing the seed and providing the fertilizer and it's destroying, completely destroying, not just the crops, for example, not just the soil, but also the water, then the rivers, because for, for example, Colombia has a lot of uh, water uh, systems and they are all interconnected. It's not that you just can isolate what is happening in a lake, but everything is interconnected. So I think it has to do with how like, uh, the states and the like, big industrial food uh, production system in the world is um, interacting. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe. I just wanted to add to what you said that it's uh, a, a main point, I think, on the, this technological package that you applied in the agricultural uh, kind of more industrial. In Argentina, in fact, is a, is a great example of that. And we are primary exporters, so I would add to that that basically, for instance, in the commodity boom at the beginnings of the 2000s, there was an, an increase in this uh, in soy and Argentinians actually do not consume soy we just culturally don't do it uh, but still of course soy uh, basically expanded the, the the borders of the agricultural sector and domestically it had many impacts like uh, lower production on wheat for instance to produce bread then you had the bread the price of bread going up and everything of course to provide uh, an international system that is uh, based also in this, uh, in this kind of, uh, uh, of trends that influence in, uh, the developing countries on their primary export. Okay, we have two questions. Do, do we take the two questions? Or? Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking on the same direction because I, I come from Brazil. And uh, you said that we, in a way, need these uh, industrial systems, this homogenizing. I was wondering in, in, to each uh, uh, extent, because you know, in Brazil, 70% of the food production comes from um, family agriculture, mm -hmm. like small lands, and they are the ones that are doing uh, ecological systems as well. So I wonder if we could just shift the paradigm, because actually the the soy, the corn we produce, it's ma mostly for fuel and for exporting to China to feed animals. Like, so I, I wonder if we could shift the paradigm and think of small agricultural okay. units in the, um, all over the world. I mean, first of all, first of all I, I can explain the logic behind pesticides and fertilizers and so on, but I, I'm not saying that it's good. I'm, I'm trying to explain historically how, how we came up with that, um, but I don't think it's uh, good. And, uh, and of course, uh, agroecology is precisely about shifting to, to a new paradigm. And, um, and I don't know if it is needed. Okay. Do people need it to eat because we eat from the small agriculture? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think it is needed in the, the, the meat chain. For, for sure. Okay, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's really a complicated problem and it's really interesting bec bec because what we're talking about is, is it's a mixture of um, ecology, what can, what can be done and what cannot be done with fertilizers, the, the natural cycling of mineral nutrients and so on. And of course, it's also a mixture with uh, uh, economy, uh, politics, and, and, and that's, um, uh, that's not my field. But of course, this is what is uh, what this is about when we talk about transition. Um, okay, I, I have many things to say. It's, I have difficulties to organize everything. Um, uh, one thing is that I have worked in, in Colombia and in, in Brazil, and, and, and um, these are complicated countries because you have a mixture of um, uh, traditional family agriculture and uh, very industrialized agriculture. Um, and uh, it's funny also because in, Bra in Brazil, you have uh, when you're looking at the agronomy research, you have a mixture of um, research that is really uh, going towards more industrialization of uh, agriculture, but you also have researches that are quite original in terms of ecology and new ways of thinking about mixing trees and cattle, and, and, and it's really a mixture of, of different things. Um, yeah, then what I want, okay, no. One thing is that uh, when you're talking about agroecology, um, organic agriculture and so on, and when you're going to talk about that to, um, I don't know, maybe to, a, uh, to the French president, uh, very often at some point people are going to say, yeah, but the human population is still increasing. So we have still to produce more and more. 
And that's the reason why we cannot go, grow everything with uh, agro, uh, agroecology, organic farming, because, uh, yeah, with organic farming, we're going to decrease the yield, uh, because, yeah, without pesticides, uh, a lot of the crops are going, is, is going to be eaten by insects and so on. And um, maybe this is partially right, but this is also partially wrong uh, for different reasons, but one reason is, okay, uh, uh, a lot of uh, agricultural surfaces are used now to produce uh, biofuel, which is not food. And uh, there is, a, okay, if you want to biofuel, it's okay, but that, then you have less food. So you have to decide. Um, also, uh, all, uh, all the, the people who are thinking about the sustainability of agriculture, they all uh, see that it's important to, to reduce the, um, the consumption of meat. And of course, in Brazil, a lot of the surfaces are used to, to, to grow cattle. Uh, and uh, uh, if we want a sustainable agriculture, in all the possible scenarios, we have to reduce the consumption of meat. Um, um, yeah, maybe I can, I, I'm an ecologist, so maybe I can give an eco uh, ecological um, uh, reason for that. Uh, basically, uh, so far, I've been talking about primary production, the production of biomass by, by uh, plants. And uh, you might know about what we call um, trophic food webs or trophic chains. Basically, the idea is that the, the plants are eaten by herbivores and then you have carnivores eating the plants. And each time you're going upwards by one trophic level, you're losing 90% uh, of the biomass and 90% of the energy. Basically, because um, when you're eating, um, when you're eating the, the cereals, you're just eating the biomass produced by photosynthesis. But when you're eating cow meat, uh, the cow needs uh, a lot of food to produce its own biomass. But the cow also needs a lot of food uh, as a source of energy. The cow has to move around, has to, um, that's respiration. So each time you're going up, uh, a trophic level, you're losing 90% of the energy of the biomass. And that's the reason why ecologically we cannot lo no longer go on eating so much meat. Uh, the other, the last reason is that we're wasting a lot of food. Um, okay, I never know the, the figures, but between the, the fields and the, my belly, I think we lose about, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, it depends on the country, it depends on the crop, but we're losing like 40% of the food. So, uh, of course, each time we're talking about sustainability of the food systems, we have first, when people are saying, okay, you cannot go into uh, organic farming because we're going to decrease the yield. The first answer is to say, okay, but stop wasting the food and stop eating meat. And um, I'm not able to do all the calculations to, to be sure about how many humans we can feed easily with the future new cropping systems. But of course, decreasing the meat uh, decreasing fossil um, bio biofuels and decreasing the waste of food. It's a good way to making the, the food system more sustainable. Okay, and then, yeah, I agree with, with what you were saying. Um, there, there is a logic, a kind of scientific logic be, be behind f uh, pesticides, fertilizers, and the, the way we homogenizing these systems. Uh, but of course, nowadays, it's also an economic, uh, it's an economic logic. Um, and for example, okay, I'm saying, okay, I don't like very much GMOs, but why not? Okay, but one big problem with the GMOs, that the, the GMOs are, are, are made by private companies that are making a huge, huge money with GMOs. And of course, uh, they want to keep making this huge money. Um, so, so that's a problem because they are not so much interested in the sustainability of the food system or in, the, um, in, in the how much money the farmers will, uh, will have. Uh, they, it's just uh, politics and money, uh, and that's a problem. Um, wh what I also wanted to say is that um, probably, uh, okay, there is a, always a kind of asymmetry between uh, industrialized agriculture and um, low-tech agroecology, organic farming. Uh, a lot of people are still believing in, uh, are still, we are still believing in technologies. Uh, and we are losing a lot of technologies. I'm losing a computer, I don't have a car, but I'm using a lot of other technologies. And um, at some 
at some time, when people are going to discuss with uh, presidents, pre French President Macron, at some time people are selling technologies and the, the people who are in power tend always to believe in, the, in these technologies. And that's one reason why it's difficult to go back to other systems. And um, I mean, that's, um, that was not about agriculture, but I'm still kind of um, um, afraid, um, surprised, negatively surprised by a uh, few, maybe it was one year ago, we were talking about the um, 5G systems for uh, mobile phone the, and the, the spread of this system in, in France. And uh, some people are against these systems. Some people think because it's, uh, it's leading to health issues. And some other people are just saying we don't need it. It's, we're going to, 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 to spend a lot, a lot of um, materials, a lot of energy for these 5G things, but we don't need it. It's not really useful for the society. And um, the only answer uh, Macron had was that um, uh, we can no longer live in, in the prehistoric time. And, and it's totally crazy because, of course, uh, the, the goal is not, I mean, um, the goal is to choose the right technology we need and not to, to choose to adopt all the new technologies just because there are new technologies. And, and yeah, and that's one, one problem, one reason why it's difficult to go back to, to, to switch to something else. Just maybe to add about the discussion of uh, the industrialization in agriculture. There is some uh, literature about uh, the intentionality of the industrialization of agriculture in the post-war, what so-called the uh, Green Revolution, mm -hmm. because after the war there was uh, machineries and production and nowhere to put it. Then they started to industrialize and heavily incentive the industrialization of the agriculture to really have where to produce and so on so far. And also about the phosphorus uh, problems in the ecosystem, that when, as you said, many of it is just waste and goes with the water. And also in the water system, lots of uh, phosphorus, then it uh, makes a, a, a good environment for uh, water plants to grow, but then with the, this amount of materials and also of plants in the water, then uh, it reduces the luminosity in the systems and also uh, becomes sometimes uh, problematic for other kind of living beings to live in this kind of ambience and so on. Then, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe you can yeah, proceed I, I, and then we... Yeah, uh, yeah, and the good thing is that the light is no longer on the screen, so... Um, okay, now this part, I, I'm going to show you that uh, in ecology, we have shown that it's really important that I was talking about biodiversity and I'm going to show you that uh, plant biodiversity is important for ecosystems. Um, in, e in ecology, we have um, implemented many experiments such as this one. And basically the idea is that you have many small plots and on each of these small plots, you have a mixture of plants. Basically, the idea is that you take maybe 50 plants and you, on each plant, you uh, randomly, you choose some, uh, some plant species. And of course, you're, you're looking at the primary production, at the biomass produced by these plants. And this graph shows that if you increase the number of species, you tend to increase the, the production. Of course, the increase, um, yeah, depending on you, each line is for a different year. And depending on the year, it's increasing more with the number of species. But at least you, you, you show that there is a, when you increase the number of species, it's going better. Um, on this graph, it's, uh, yeah, it's more difficult to explain. But basically, you represent the, uh, it's the same type of experiment. And you're um, looking at the biomass, the ratio of the biomass in 1988, uh, divided by the bionas in 1986. And uh, in between, uh, there, has, there, have, there has been a drought. And uh, of course, because of the drought, the, the plants are no longer growing as, as well as before. And when you increase the number of species, you increase this ratio, so you tend to reach the same biomass as before the drought. So what it's uh, suggesting is that the number of species, the biodiversity of plants, 
uh, is increasing the capacity of your ecosystem to resist to, um, to perturbations, to, to disturbance. Okay, so I can now I can try to explain to you the different mechanisms behind the, these effects. Uh, yeah, it's slightly complicated. Uh, you have two types of mechanisms. You have what we call complementarity and facilitation, and on the other side, you have the sampling effect. Complementarity, probably it's easy to understand. Basically, the idea is that, um, okay, do you have ever heard about what we call the ecological niche? Uh, basically, the ecological niche of a plant or of any species, it's the conditions needed by these plants to grow and, and reproduce and, and so on. Um, so he, here, this, this square is kind of representing all the possible ecological niche within your system. So if you have only one plant, this plant is not very likely to occupy all the possible ecological niches in your systems. If you're increasing the number of species within your systems, collectively, this species are more likely to occupy all the possible ecological niches. This means that they are going to exploit more e efficiently all the possible resources within the systems. Um, this is due to the fact that each plant has, a, has, a, has its own ecological niche. And basically, each plant species, if you have different plant species, all will have a different, slightly different niche. So if you put them together, they will exploit better all the resources. And when we call about facilitation, it's because when you increase the number of plants in your systems, you might also increase the positive interactions between the, the plants of your systems. Um, I don't know if, uh, yeah, one good example of facilitation, again, it's when you, in the same systems, you have, uh, same ecosystem, you have grasses and you have legumes legume plants that are fixing the nitrogen and you have a kind of the, the, the fixation of nitrogen by the legume plants is helping the grasses to grow. And um, mechanisms leading to complementarity, it could be, I don't know, it could be that some, some plants are growing um, shallow roots, they just have roots at the soil surface and some other plants have deep roots and together they can exploit, f exploit fully all the water at the bottom of the soil soil and at the, um, yeah, at the bottom and at the top of the soil. Um, and so this could lead, these mechanisms could lead to such graph when you increase biodiversity, you can increase the total production and um, this leads to a total production that can be higher than the uh, best monoculture. You can reach a better production than the best plant species alone. The sampling effect is a little bit more difficult to explain. Basically, the idea is that you have a pool of, a species, of, of species. You know that in this area, you can have all these species can, can grow. And locally, in your, in your field, in your meadow, you have a, a sample of these plant species. And of course, um, um, the idea is that you have local conditions. And you also have the environmental conditions as are, are varying from year to year because the climate is changing. Sometimes the winter is, uh, is very uh, cold, sometimes the, wind, the summer is very dry. So the, depending on the year and depending on the places where you're choosing to grow your plants, you have different conditions. And you don't, you're not really sure about what species will grow better this year in this condition. So if you're only choosing one species, uh, by chance, you could find the, the, the species that is going to grow very well in these conditions, uh, but it's not very likely. It's, if it's only by chance, it's not very likely, you're not very likely to choose the best species. If you're choosing to grow many species at the same time, you're more likely to find some species, at least one species, that is going to be very well adapted to the local conditions during this year. And this is the, the sampling effect. And um, this sampling effect is supposed to stabilize the production. Because we, when you have more species, you will have always some species adapted to the conditions. And you will ha always have some good production coming from some species. Whereas when you have one species, just by chance, this species can just get down, can die one 
one year because it's, that's not the right condition for this species. And um, uh, yeah, talking about economy, when you talk to farmers, uh, very often the farmers, okay, they want to have a good production, but for them, very often, it's more important to stabilize their production than to increase always their production. Um, it's, it's important when you feed on your production because you need always some food, so you, be sh you need to be sure that you will produce some food. And uh, for economical reasons, it's also important to stabilize your production. Uh, for example, um, in, in intensive agriculture, farmers tends to, uh, I mean, they have to buy big machines, so they are always borrowing uh, money to the, to the banks, and they always need some production each year to be able to reimburse uh, the, the banks. So that's the two, mechanism, two mechanisms why it's important to increase uh, biodiversity in, uh, in cropping systems. Um, and there are many ways you can increase biodiversity in cropping systems. I have been talking about cover crops, so here in between your um, ranks of corn, you have some grasses. At the scale of the landscape, it's important to have a diversified, um, you have different crops. Here it's probably mostly meadows, but it can be interesting to have meadows, to have fields, fields of different plants. I've been talking about uh, agroforestry, so it's also a mixture of um, trees and here cereals. Um, of course, it's the landscapes, it's also good to, to um, to keep trees for the same reasons. Here you have uh, wheats, but it's a mixture of uh, wheat varieties. Uh, and we have already seen that mixing, increasing the genetic diversity of your crops, it um, allows your crops to better resist to insects, pathogens, and, and so on. And um, yeah, wh what is interesting maybe is that in traditional cropping systems, very often people were mixing species, were mixing varieties, we're managing, we're selecting varieties where that were kept genetically diverse. So somehow uh, switching to agroecology, switching to a more sustainable agriculture will mean that we will somehow have to go back to other systems, and um, which is okay. Um, this is okay, but yeah, we still have to think about how to do it in the sense that I was saying that uh, um, it's very easy to, uh, to have many to have different species growing together if you harvest them by hand. If you want to harvest them using machines, you have to really think about how you're doing it, what kind of machine you want to use. For example, here I think you have a mixture of corn and beans. If you want to uh, harvest that using machines, you really have to find the right way to do it. Um, so you, 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 I think we have good solutions, but then depending on um, how much um, you, uh, how much you want to use machines, for example, uh, this can constrain the type of cropping systems we're, we're going to use. Um, yeah, I think it's nearly finished. Okay. Well, okay, that's interesting. Um, in, in this graph, you see that the, um, yeah, increasing the number of varieties, we're increasing the services produced by the crops. And what people have done um, I was talking about uh, ecosystem services earlier. Ecosystem services are all the services provided by an ecosystem to humans. So they can provide food, but they can also store carbon in the soil to mitigate climate change. They can clean waters. They can, uh, an ecosystem can be beautiful and provide some cultural services to humans. So more and more, we think that um, uh, producing food is not enough for cropping systems. We also must provide other services. And what this graph is suggesting is that when you take into account more and more services, uh, the slope, the impact of your biodiversity is uh, higher and higher. Um, the, the, the rationale behind that is that when you're looking at only one service, you can think that only one plant species can uh, optimize the provision of this service. Maybe you can find the right plant species that is going to produce the more food. But if I want also my cropping system to store carbon in the soil, to protect this bird species, whatever, you can understand that it's better to mix different species or to mix different varieties that will combine their uh, capabilities to provide different services. And that's what we're showing that. So if we want, the idea behind that is that if we, 
go towards more diverse grouping systems. Probably we will be able to provide more, uh, uh, more, diverse, a more diverse array of, uh, of services. Um, this graph is, uh, is also interesting, a bit complicated. Um, the idea behind this graph is that um, if the environmental conditions are optimal for your plants, uh, maybe if you give to the plants a lot of pesticides, a lot of fertilizer, the system is very homogeneous. Maybe you need only one plant because this plant will be in the best condition for this plant and it will produce a lot of biomass. If the conditions are not as good and if the conditions are variable in time and space, uh, then probably it's really interesting to uh, go towards more diverse systems because you will need uh, positive interactions between your plant species. You will need the complementarity and the sampling effects I was talking about um, to, yeah, to produce food. And so in this graph, the idea is that under optimal conditions, when you're increasing your number of varieties or your number of species, you're increasing the yield, but you're not increasing the yield that much. When, on the contrary, you have non-optimal conditions, you, when you're increasing the number of varieties or your number of species, you're increasing um, the production a little bit more. And well, th this is something, th th this is still de debated. It's not fully sure. Uh, but this is interesting but because this, will, this would tend to show that if you're going, the, the benefits of going towards more diverse cropping systems will increase when we will decrease the use of pesticides and the use of uh, fertilizers. Uh, so that there is a kind of good, um, good combination. I think I, I'm nearly, in, oh, okay. Uh, um, the last chapter is about accumulating carbon in the soil. Um, I was talking about the organic matter. I was within the soil. I was saying that this organic matter is very important for soil fertility. What you show here is that the, the dark color at the top of the soil is due to the organic matter. And the organic matter, of course, is coming from the decomposition and the degradation of the leaves and the, and the roots. And this organic matter is very important because it allows us soil to store more water, to store mineral nutrients. It allows the aggregation of the soil in, uh, in more stable aggregates. Uh, and it's also this organic matter, as I was saying, is a stock of carbon. So the more carbon, the more organic matter you put into your soils, uh, the more maybe you are able to mitigate climate change. Uh, okay. And uh, um, probably I've said that earlier is that in intensive cropping si system, we tend to have lost organic matter. Uh, the soils tend to have lost organic matter. So this graph is showing that when you stop tillage, and tillage can be very intense and repeated in uh, intensive cropping systems, when you stop tillage, the more you're stopping tillage after some years, you're increasing the amount of organic matter into you of the soil. And the idea, but it's, yeah, there are still debates about that also, is that when you're mixing the soil layers, you're kind of stimulating the decomposition of the organic matter. Uh, so stopping uh, tillage should be good to increase the amount of organic matter in your soil. Um, of course, of course, another idea is that if you have to want to have organic matter in your soils, you need to have inputs of organic matter in your soil. And um, yeah, basically, this is what is shown in this graph. When you increase the carbon inputs to your soils, you're increasing the accumulation of organic matter uh, in the soil. Um, what is interesting but complicated behind that is that, of course, I was saying earlier that when you're a farmer, you're growing plants because you're going to export a part of the biomass of the plant. And of course, the more biomass you're exporting, the less biomass you're returning to the soil, and then the less organic matter you will have into your soils. So there is a kind of compromise between the amount of organic matter you're leaving in the soil and the amount of food you're going to export. Um, so you have to, yeah, to think about that. Um, OK, I think I can conclude. Um, but I think the, 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 uh, the, the, this last, last idea about, okay, I want to export food, but I also want to keep organic matter in my soil. 
uh, I want to export food and I know that the food is containing uh, proteins and thus it's containing nitrogen, but it's also con containing phosphorus. That's really the idea of trade-offs. I want to export food, but I want to keep organic matter and mineral nutrients in my soils. And that's very general in ecology. That's also very general in, in agriculture. Um, wh what I want to say is that I think we have good solutions. Increasing biodiversity is good for, for the sustainability of agriculture. Uh, decreasing uh, pesticides, decreasing, decreasing um, fertilizer is good. But they will always have trade-offs. It's difficult, in my opinion, to be able um, to produce uh, a lot, a lot of food uh, without any, any inconvenience, without any, any drawback. You will always have um, trade-offs. You will always have difficult decisions to make about how you're going to optimize the, the, the youth cropping system and its sustainability. Um, so yeah, wha the first message of my lecture is that, okay, we have good solutions coming from ecology and getting inspiration from a uh, um, natural ecosystem is really interesting and, and useful for, to increase the sustainability of the cropping systems. But then we will have to face trade-offs. We really, really have to adjust things um, because it's not, I don't think it's possible to have solutions that is perfect uh, for all, um, all what we want. A lot of food, a lot of sustainability, a lot of carbon in the soil a lot of biodiversity, and so on. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's... Yeah, the, the conclusion is that it's kind of abstr um, abstract of what I have said. Uh, what we want is to close the nutrient loop, basically to have a more efficient nutrient cycling. Uh, we want to reduce the impact of pathogen, herbivores, and weeds. And we want to protect um, soils and what we can do to do so uh, we can increase the cultivated biodiversity increase the diversity of the plants we're growing um, we have to pay attention at the non-cultivated biodiversity uh, I haven't talked a lot about that actually but for example I'm, I'm, I have lot, I've, I've worked a lot about earthworms and what earthworms are doing in the soils and how they help the plants to grow but basically if you want to sustainable cropping systems, you have to think about this type of biodiversity. Okay, I don't control the earthworms, but I need at least to have uh, practices that are, that are allowing the, 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 uh, the, the, bio, the earthworms to, to live. Um, probably you know also about bees and pollinations. We know that we need, uh, well, not for cereals, but for vegetables and fruits, we need to have pollinators, we need bees, butterflies, bumblebees, whatever. And probably you know that uh, these insects are um, killed by pesticides, basically. And um, so, yeah, if, we, if you want cropping system, sustainable cropping systems, you need to pay attention at this type of biodiversity. So we have to, lose, to use less pesticide. Um, probably it's important to to, to, to pay attention at the spa spatial and temporal structure of your cropping systems. Um, at some point I was saying that uh, natural ecosystems are heterogeneous and probably increasing the heterogeneity of cropping system is good for the sustainability. And this temporal structure is also important. Um, hmm, I haven't talked about fallow. Uh, fallow is a, is a way to restore soil fertility by stopping growing uh, food on your soil. You stop growing food on your soil for a couple of years. You're leaving um, grasses to grow, maybe legumes, maybe small trees. And after a while, uh, this has increased, uh, again, the fertility of your soil, which is interesting. And what is also important is rotations. The rotation is a fact, and in all traditional cropping systems, there are farmers are applying rotations, meaning that they are not growing the same crop each year in the same place. Uh, and in complex traditional cropping system, maybe they can grow 10 plant species, and there is a complex rotation between these 10 plant species. And it's also a way to increase the biodiversity of the systems. And uh, basically, you have to, to think about the way you're working your soils. You have maybe to stop um, tillage, or for, yeah, to find um, ways to, to, to work your soils in a more sustainable ways. And I think that's it.
So, Eniko.